All right, terrific. Um, so good to be with everybody. I'm Ellen Van Osten um, at the Weatherhead School in at Case Western Reserve University, which is in uh, lovely Cleveland, Ohio. If you haven't visited, we hope to welcome you at some point in the near future. Um, and tagging off of Eric and um, his presentation about process, um, you are the bridge, Eric. So thank you so much for connecting us from last week to this week. I think I picked up your mental telepathy there. Um, Amazing. Amazing. And the way that, uh, that um, I've been thinking about our conversations is um, visually and using the, the bridge that Eric uh, mentioned actually to kind of separate out or tease out some areas of focus. Um, and for our conversation here, and, and what I've been thinking about um, is, as Richard teed up, the kind of what's across the bridge. Um, so what um, do we know and what can we learn together um, in thinking about the interaction of a number of factors? And so um, what I wanted to kind of zero in on um, is the, the coaching outcomes, which I think about those also in terms of results or in terms of impact. So ways to kind of conceptualize it a little bit. Uh, for me, I wanted to thank um, Richard Yu for this opportunity, but all of you on um, this group and um, being a part of it is incredibly energizing. The last time I was able to be a part of a conversation specifically about outcomes was two years ago. Um, when uh, Melvin Smith and I and a number of you joined us for uh, a symposium on desired outcomes in coaching. Um, Angela Passarelli presented there, uh, Tony Grant uh, presented there as well. Um, and so it was just an incredibly energizing conversation. And um, I'm reminded of that and how much we enjoyed ourselves, but also how much we took away uh, from that. Um, so just uh, for me, um, thinking about Tony and that that conversation was top of mind. But I also wanted to specifically express my uh, gratitude for so many um, of you in our group who have provided us with a very rich foundation of scholarship. And the scholarship, of course, is very broad, but in particular, I zeroed in on some that were meta-analyses or collections um, of, of kind of theories, but or um, in particular references and of studies and conceptual work that helps to inform how we might think about outcomes. So certainly you'll recognize a, a lot of these folks, um, including many who are with us um, here, um, but I'm sure also um, in your own work, you've come across uh, these as well. Um, and um, some of, I've only gone back 20 years, but obviously there's some um, key work that even uh, was earlier uh, in the 90s as well. So again, this is not meant as an exhaustive list, but zeroing in on, on um, some of the um, meta-analyses that have uh, really, I think, helped to inform us and give us an important launch pad to think um, more broadly and think more deeply about outcomes. So in doing so, I wanted to just offer an observation that um, definition really serves as the starting premise for us. And there's a range of definitions uh, in the literature and they influence how we study coaching outcomes. So coaching um, sometimes is viewed um, as concerned with performance. Other times it's uh, concerned with learning and development. Uh, sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one, um, and relational. In a couple of cases, including um, a lot of the, the lens that uh, my colleagues and I often think a lot about is um, coaching for what purpose and change uh, being a way to think about that. And there's also kind of a, a qualification there around what type of coaching. So in terms of uh, the definitions, there's ones that refer to coaching broadly and then others that provide us with a way of understanding it and thinking about it that's more specific. I chose um, executive coaching here, um, and, um, and there's a number of references, right, that help to inform it uh, because of 
um, a comment that uh, Eric, you just made that for uh, me and for our, um, my colleagues, we, we think a lot about as well, and that is coaching has to be practical. And so it seems like the workplace then is a very salient context, right? For us to uh, think about and study um, coaching. And why is that? Well, um, organizations pursue learning, training, and development initiatives to improve the effectiveness of human capital. And they're the primary users and sponsors of leadership development. And they spend a lot of money on that. Coaching is considered one of the interventions or mechanisms uh, in the repertoire of leadership development that organizations access. But that does present right away some dilemmas for us um, as uh, scholars, and that is organizations want to, to know about the ROI. So Eric um, teed up for us that um, often they're the managers, right, uh, the representatives of the organizations want action, they want to see the behavior change. And expanding that or building upon that at an organization level, they want to know what the return on investment is for coaching. So in order for us to be able to uh, be in that conversation, right? We need to be able to access outcomes that have a value with an objective measure, such as a person's time or money that's invested or saved or spent, or um, some um, objective measure around people, including clients, employees, and so on, who are hired or retained or lost. So those are a couple examples, but you know the search for objective measures um, is you know fraught with challenge. Another dilemma um, to be able to do compelling um, coaching outcome research in the workplace is the access to uh, big enough samples that enable us to draw some generalizations um, and have those apply across you know a much broader context. And so in our own work, in, in which I'll share um, some highlights, in working with organizations, it's um, a challenge to be able to find uh, populations that meet all of our criteria and provide us with um, um, you know, large enough uh, sample size for statistical analysis. But if we look at kind of the literature and inform ourselves as broadly as we can, we do actually find there is some kind of coalescence, there is some convergence around the overall aim of coaching. And so um, I would offer to our group some um, thinking that one of the so what's uh, to coaching is that it's fundamentally about facilitating or prompting or encouraging, right? Some degree of change, learning and or growth. And that's well established um, across um, a number of different um, studies. In some other studies, those are uh, framed a little differently as cognitive, skill-based, or affective. So I offer those as kind of ways that we might think about it, or maybe you think about it in your own research, and then how and where you uh, and your work um, might fall. There's also um, another lens into a, a significant area of study, which is the relationship, and the relationship in this case to the coach and the coachee or client. I do want to um, acknowledge that some of the language here, um, it's preferred that we use coach and client. We've uh, talked about this quite a bit ourselves, and so um, we end up kind of uh, using those somewhat interchangeably, and I'm mindful that in this presentation, I leaned into the coachy framing. So consider those as somewhat interchangeable, the coach-client relationship. Um, in um, a number of studies, um, the working alliance is how that is um, researched and discussed. And in many studies, uh, we're examining what that uh, relationship between the coach and the client or coach and coachy um, really uh, represents or what the qualities and characteristics are. So helping us to discover and understand what does it mean to have a quality relationship? Um, but even at a, a kind of broader level, considering um, is the relationship an outcome right, of coaching or is it a mediator or a moderator? 
So uh, that's something for, um, I think, us to discuss as a group and think about. Based on the studies that have been done, there is um, a pretty substantial um, um, evidence so far that the relationship is so salient to coaching that it's, um, it stands alone as one of the outcomes as well. Now, if we kind of drill down a little bit more and kind of look at what do we mean or how can some of our constructs fit underneath these kind of broader umbrella categories, right? Um, so when we think about areas of say cognitive um, outcome, that's where we might find changes in knowledge, uh, strategies, problem solving. Competencies and skills are job-related competence, uh, leadership skills, and so on. Affective could include self-efficacy, well-being, engagement, satisfaction. Performance uh, would be individual team and organization, organizational results. And relationship considerations would be, again, be um, the kind of relational factors that help us understand um, that connection between the coach and the client. Now, there's been a lot of compelling work done drilling into some of these outcomes. So you see a number of them here. Coaching leading to improved learning and performance has been an area of study. Coaching leading to an examining manager and leader effectiveness including the two that, um, that I've spotlighted there, specifically look at multi-source feedback as one of the mechanisms. Coach, um, leading to goal setting and achievement um, has been a, a, a primary area of focus. And then coaching related to workplace stress is one that um, has been studied and um, is emerging and maybe um, one that for all of us uh, globally, you know, is uh, important for us to be considering given the environment that we're in. That's, that's a question that we find ourselves uh, thinking about quite a bit. Um, and then also the coaching relationship impact on outcomes, um, such as self-efficacy, such as work engagement, career satisfaction, and, and so on. Now at the Weatherhead School of Management, um, we have a coaching research lab that uh, fuels our inquiry and collaboration, and we're um, excited to share that with you. Um, the Coaching Research Lab uh, was founded in 2014. Um, Richard Boyatzis and Melvin Smith and I um, uh, founded it then and have a number of colleagues here uh, in this group who um, join us as uh, fellows in the lab. It's a collaboration between researchers and practitioners, so organizations uh, become members of the lab. And together, um, our whole reason to exist is to advance coaching research and our collective understanding about coaching excellence, what really drives that. So I just um, offer a couple of different inquiries here that um, can give you a, um, an indication of some of our, our work. Uh, most recently, we're, we've been uh, one of our doctoral students looked at how group coaching affects progress and well-being with progress of PhD students being a for performance metric, well-being, of course, being one of those affective outcomes. Coach effectiveness as a facilitator of sustained change. Uh, that's something that actually I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, my colleague Scott Taylor and Angela Pessarelli and I have been thinking about that, and, and I um, can share a model that represents some of our um, our recent thinking. Um, I had an opportunity to, to do a study years ago with banking executives, and we looked at emotional intelligence and coaching on leader effectiveness and the impact of you know, coaching as it related to, um, to uh, prompting and leading to performance, career satisfaction, and work engagement. Uh, there's also a whole body of studies that we've summarized in um, our recent book, um, Helping People Change, Coaching with Compassion for Lifelong Learning and Growth, which um, that I co-authored with Richard Boyatzis and Melvin Smith, but, um, it, but has a ton of studies by many of you and certainly many of our close colleagues um, here. So it was a fascinating and really humbling uh, um, effort on our part to be able to coalesce a lot of those into, into that book. And that's what makes it such a, um, a rich collection for us uh, because it helps 
us understand coaching for intentional change and why and how that works. Um, we've talked last week and Richard, um, um, I know teed this up a bit as did Melvin, but uh, we're curious about the competencies of coaches. And so that's something that uh, we've been um, uh, beginning to, to look at over the last several years and, and hoping to uh, make some good progress on in the new future in terms of uh, the sample size. Uh, we have a coaching modality study that Angela Passarelli and I uh, started uh, years ago, which is a field experiment examining different communication modalities, their impact on the coaching relationship and coaching outcomes. Um, and we've also uh, looked at uh, emotional attractors in, in vision. So Richard and Kylie Rochford and Scott Taylor uh, published on that, um, as well as vision-based coaching, which uh, Angela Passarelli has studied and published. So this gives you um, a glimpse into the inquiry uh, that has stimulated a lot of our curiosity and our work both individually um, and collectively. I wanted to um, just double click on two um, just to give you a little bit more um, of a, um, information around that in the short time that I have. One thing that we do um, that informs our inquiry is that we look at measuring change at three levels, the ideal self, the real self, and the relationship. And so you see some, um, some different dimensions that in particular we, we think of as coming under those broader frames um, including self-insight. So Eric, you had teed that up and, and that is something that, that really resonates for us as well. And in particular, we look at self-awareness and self-insight around um, a person's sense of their ideal self, core values, purpose, identity, personal vision being elements of those. The real self is a discovery of awareness and insight around um, strengths and struggles, as well as actions and behaviors. And so, um, how, you know, what a person is demonstrating or seeking to demonstrate would come underneath that umbrella. And then the, um, tying in the relationship as being salient and, and central to a, a person's ability to change, we're curious about the presence of a relationship and the quality of it. Now, many of you are familiar with, um, from last week, Melvin uh, Smith and, and Angela Passarelli teed this up, but we adopt the uh, central premise that coaching is fundamentally about change. And therefore we draw upon theories of how adults change in ways that are uh, sticky, ways that in, are enduring. Um, and so guided by the intentional change theory, um, you know, they, that gives us a jumping off point to consider both the ideal self and the real self, certainly as, as starting points, but not limited to that. Um, but one of our studies recently um, was a qualitative outcomes and coaching study, which um, Angela Passarelli is uh, the lead researcher on, and she and I and a, um, another colleague uh, work together on. It's a field experiment with random assignment to different modalities, different communication modalities, where individuals um, experience three different sessions. So there's consistency in the coaching, but the modalities are, um, are varied. And um, some of the findings from uh, that inquiry are that the most commonly described outcomes of coaching uh, for the um, coachees were heightened self-awareness, being able to formulate a vision for themselves, setting goals, and self-directed change. Um, the coaches' views on outcomes tended to shift after the conclusion of the coaching. So we collected some input at the very beginning, um, and then again um, at the conclusion of three coaching sessions, and then again uh, what would be a year um, after the very beginning, so seven and a half months later. Um, and so what you see in that, um, that uh, time span is at the end of that more emphasis on vision and motivation um, and self-awareness and goal setting as outcomes immediately following coaching. And then later more emphasis on reflection, social awareness, enacting change. So that's the, where some of that, uh, those actions and behaviors come into play and acquiring new tools. And so there seems to be um, kind of a, there's a shift that we're curious about and that we're finding that can inform the studies for us. Coaches and coaches do report fairly similar outcomes 
and neither gender or race influenced uh, the reported outcomes. Now, um, kind of fast forward, um, some of the, um, the recent work in the last several years um, that, um, that Scott Taylor and Angela Passarelli and I have been considering is how do we move beyond establishing if coaching works? Because drawing upon all the fantastic work of this community and others, there's you know, a large body of evidence for that. We are moving to how does it work? And that's been kind of served up for us by a number of the meta-analyses um, around like, we need to better understand that. And so we've been examining the interaction among different factors, including the frameworks that capture how adults learn, grow, and change. So that, that's salient. Uh, the high quality relationship between the coach and the coachee and the competencies of the coach that work interactively and then reciprocally to inspire direct support and sustain the, the person's ability to change. They have seen that. Um, may have seen that um, in this model here, it was published in a recent um, article in Leadership Quarterly, um, where we are looking at the competencies of the coach, the needs of the coach, I'm sorry, the needs of the coachee, um, and how they internalize their own motivation for uh, behavior and change. And then, you know, what, how that's related to their outcomes. And that provides then a feedback loop into uh, the coach needs and um, the coach's internalized motivation and so on. And so um, for us, we, we think about thing, this kind of model here and bringing into play um, uh, motivational theory and self-determination theory in particular um, as informing um, our understanding and views around, again, how uh, coaching really works when it does. And so um, as I conclude here, um, I will offer this as kind of uh, catching you up on our latest thinking is that we're expanding our frame or seeking to do that. And uh, ourselves is the lens that we've been using into understanding outcomes too narrow or perhaps incomplete. And I'm encouraging all of us as scholars to consider a maybe more nuanced view or a more complete view in looking at the relationship between uh, these factors as uh, another frontier in coaching research. Um, the other things that are on our minds and what are currently um, we're actively pursuing um, in the coaching research lab through faculty um, work as well as the work of our doctoral students are what you see here. Um, uh, Udayan Dar is one of our students and he is doing his dissertation work on the effect of um, work experience on shaping the ideal self of individuals over time. We have a number of studies emerging around peer and group coaching uh, by uh, both um, Hector Martinez and Richard Boyatzis, who um, Hector is also in our group, and a couple of our doctoral students. Um, so they're examining uh, peer coaching in um, medical education settings and in corporate settings. Embodiment in coaching and, in, and the connection between our brain and our bodies and our behavior is being um, studied by Amanda Blake. And uh, we are also looking at team coaching as in, an intervention in prompting uh, learning and development of certain competencies, in particular, conflict management competencies of MBA students. So that's one where uh, Melvin Smith and I are working with uh, a couple of our doctoral students on that currently. And so that for me concludes um, my, um, my thoughts. And so I hope that this, um, provides for you some stimulation, uh, maybe even kind of a way to get your head wrapped around um, the body of work. I know for me in preparing for today, I was just really energized to, to dig back into, into this and, um, and be able to kind of wrap my head around that. So I hope the same is true for all of you. I look forward to our conversations.